Hey, everybody, welcome on today's episode of Founder University. We have once again, one, two great talks, always in pairs. The first talk is how to talk about design thinking. It's a fancy term, right? But let's make it super practical here. The goal here is for you to create a memorable brand for your startup from day one. So you're going to learn in today's episode tips on designing a logo and how to build trust with the visual components of your website and your brand. Also, how to use the same tools uh, that big companies use to build that memorable brand. So we're going to give you the tips, we're going to give you the tools, and then how you can position your messaging to increase sales quickly. After that, we've got a great talk from our friends at NetSuite. They're going to break down how to get all your messy financial data under control. This is super important for you to get done early in the life of your startup because it only gets more complicated. So what are you going to learn? The importance of a crisp, clean P&L profit and loss statement. You've, never, you've heard this term before, you don't know what it is. Now you're going to know what it is, plus how to present accurate and relevant information with your financial data. Why do you need that? You have investors, you have a board, you have a management team, you need to be able to present these accurately and in a relevant fashion. Finally, how to improve your accounting process, how to make it easy peasy lemon squeezy. All right, two great talks, one on branding, one on finances. Let's get to work. Hey there, I'm Scott. I'm going to talk through the founders crash course on building a strong brand. I'm a family man with three kids. I'm a designer with 15 years of experience. I'm a founder of Timewell. And I'm also a certified brand specialist at a branding studio called Lunar. So let me dive right in. My first question is out of all of these options of water bottles, which one would you buy? And you'll find that most of the time people don't make a decision of what's inside the water bottle, but actually on the outside and everything else that it means. So if we look at something like Arrowhead, you might think that that's the one that you get to your soccer games. Or Voss, that's somebody that, you know, you could assume what kind of car they drive with that. Or Liquid Death, the fact that they just raised 700 or are valued at $700 million. And it had very little to do with what was inside and again, more on the outside. So looking here at these two screens, without really knowing what they do, you have a hunch that one of these works better than the other. I'd say 100% of the, the time people say that B works better. So the question is, what is branding? And to still admit, branding is not your logo. And to describe that a little further, I'd love for you to think about how you would describe why someone should buy from Apple. And most of the time, it's something like it's really simple, it's easy to use, it's fun, it just works. And I can almost guarantee that those are not words that Apple has told you to say, but it's something that you felt over time through a lot of different experiences. So we could argue that more branding is someone's gut feeling about your company or service. And in in reality, it's what they say it is. It's not what you say it is. So again, in a nutshell, branding isn't your logo, but it is somebody else's feeling and how that they describe it. So the goal at, at the end for branding is to align what you say it is and what they say it is. And that's what we're going to talk about. Again, we'll start at the top of this mountain here, which uh, again, I, running a, a branding studio, people come to us often and say, hey, we need a new brand. And typically what that means is we need a new flag planted on the top of a mountain, being our logo, or we need new styles. And so we go into the conversation more. And they say, well, maybe it's more of our website, or we need a new product, it doesn't quite feel right. And so as we go in a little further, as you can see from this visual, is that we need to go under the water to what isn't seen. And that's brand strategy. And this is where we can talk about their purpose, mission, vision, values, what their culture is like, what's their goals as a company, and also how do they posi position themselves in a way that's so unique that people will come to them. And to illustrate that a little further, is that brand strategy leads to deliberate differentiation. And this is what I do all in a nutshell. As we look at how we want to position your brand, it's that in a sea of competitors, we want you to be the only one that customers will go with because you are so different. And your job as a leader is to give clarity about that. So as you see that you want to lead your team in a specific direction, you need to cast a vision to say, here's where we're going. 
And in the days where you can't be the one leading, and I would argue you shouldn't be the one who is telling everybody all the time, every single task, what they need to do, you need to be able to cast a vision for them to be able to run on their own. In reality, that's what brand strategy should lead to is for your team to be able to answer this question on their own, which is what's the right decision here? That could come to how do we respond to this customer in a consistent way? How should we design this billboard? What should we do for this screen? And that should be all around that you have a clear vision for your company of where we need to go. And there is a structure for that. It's what I like to use, which is a brand strategy pyramid. And this is what we use with clients, but we're gonna go through a couple of these today. So there's purpose, mission, vision, values, look and feel, goals, and tactics. And just for us right now, we're gonna cover purpose, vision, values, and look and feel. First of all, purpose. This is your why and deeper cause that would be written about in the history books when you succeed. And here is a template for how to do it. We won't go through that now, but you can take a look at it later, which is two and then fill in the blank, some positive improving verb, and then aimed at a specific group of people two, And then the end goal is for them to reach a specific state. And again, this has nothing to do with money. It won't change with the market and it should almost feel impossible. An example of this is Tesla's which is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And you can see if and I'd argue when they accomplish this, it will be written about in the history books. And you can take this the next step further is their mission would be in line with the how that they do that is they build Tesla's Tesla cars to be able to accomplish this purpose. Next is the vision, which is a clear scene that can be easily understood and visualized. And this is where we see a world where, and then fill in the blank. Microsoft, for example, which is exciting to see that they've accomplished this, their vision statement used to be a computer on every desktop in every home. And what's really helpful about a vision statement is it will help your team have a clear picture of what they need to do to accomplish it. So back when this was written, a computer couldn't fit on a desktop at all. And so they had to think, how could we continue to refine our process to be able to accomplish this? Next is your values. These are the core beliefs that will ultimately guide what you do and how you do it. And understanding these values, something like we take care of our customers above and beyond will allow your team to run freely to know if somebody needs help resetting their password for Netflix while they're on a phone call with you is that that's completely okay. And when asked what he'd do differently if he could start his company all over again, Zappos CEO, Tony Shea had this to say, if I could go back and do Zappos all over again, I would actually come up with our values from day one. And for someone who sold his company to Amazon for $1.2 billion, I think I'd pay attention. So next we'll dive into visual identity. And again, this is arguably what people come to most often when they say, hey, I need, I need a new brand, which is I need a new logo and we'll dive right in. But first, really your brand comes first in people's minds by your name. And I argue this is more important to get right than your visual because you can change that over time. But you think of a company like Coca-Cola, for them to change their name would have huge impacts on their business. And the test that I like to run with is if you're at a loud party and you have to say, I'm the founder of blank name and we do blank. If you have to explain every single time how it's spelled and it's a, a get name dot so, uh, then they're just going to forget it over time. So again, it's really hard to do and it's harder than ever, but it's really important to make sure that it can click in someone's mind. And then on the, the visual side, what should you do for your logo? I like to keep these four points in mind, which is make it clear, make it scalable, make it memorable. And then make sure that it has some sort of connection to your value that you, that you offer. And as an example, let's look at TimeWell's logo. So here, TimeWell is a platform that helps families connect with different generations by recording their life stories to photos with their voice. So what we have here is the, the icon on the side. It's actually a, an hourglass flipped on its side to essentially pause time. And then there's these two linking back and forward arrows 
showing the future and the past, older generation to the younger generation linking together. And this visual here, I wanted to make sure that it's really flexible and scalable. And we'll see how that looks. Every brand should be able to be flipped in both white and black as well. So if you have a primary color, make sure that it's flexible there. It should also be scalable on size. So an app icon, browser icon, like a favicon or your logo for your website. Also, it should be able to be scalable to a billboard size. Now let's look at some different logos that maybe are some not to do's and some recommended to do's. On the left side, you'll see here, these are something you might find online if you get a, a logo for, you know, a couple bucks. And on the right, you probably will recognize that these companies are doing all right. On the left side, you'll see that these ones do not work well for mobile. And with the majority of browsing now done on phones, it's more critical than ever that your logo can work with all those scalable methods like I just shared. So the question is, how do you build this? The first thing I would do for anybody looking to build their logo is to start with some sort of personality sliders like this. And for Timewell, I'd probably put mine here. So it's more professional, it's more reserved than it is allowed, it's more clean than experimental, and you get the rest. So you kind of want to put a personality to how it looks. And one thing to keep in mind is that your logo and your icon shouldn't tell the whole story. It's simply a recognizable mark that will connect to people. What about color? So color improves brand recognition by up to 80%. I often see new founders who mix too many colors together. I would focus on just one. And there's visuals like this that you can find online that get your personality and the feeling to match. So again, you might find that majority of banks use blue because psychologically it evokes trust. So now we've created a huge brand logo. How does that look like in the wild? First thing you'll probably want to do is launch your website. We'll see a couple examples here that guaranteed most people have seen and they all have the same structure and that's really important to get the structure right because you have seven seconds and seven seconds to what? You have seven seconds before they scroll through and they don't find what they're looking for and then somebody will press the most press button on the internet, which is the back button. So our goal is to make sure that that doesn't happen. They click and they convert. There's a structure for that. And we'll dive in. So this is based off uh, an example I'll show at the end. But looking at point one here, if you follow this structure for above the fold, so on desktop, before you have to scroll, this is showing you you're in the right place and you can keep going from here. So step one is we have explained the value you provide in the title. Next, in a subtitle, explain how you'll actually create it. Step three, let the user visualize it. Use the visual with a video or photo or some sort of mock-up. Make it believable with social proof. And five, make taking the next step easy. So look at that. What is that clear call to, a, call to action? And here we have something like get started for just $1. Uh, get started, sign up. Maybe you can push that a little further to be more specific. I would highly recommend looking at marketingexamples.com for the full layout of this. They have done an absolutely incredible job on building a landing page. Kind of summarizing, if you wanted to look at what are next steps for branding, these are some books that have completely changed my thought process and shaped how I think about branding. So feel free to steal all these. I hope you enjoy them. Please let me know if uh, you've read any of them or will read any. Also, some general design resources. Say, well, what do I do about, are there any pictures I can use? Are there any examples of maybe some good login screens or desktop screens or something like that? I would take a look at all of these options and all these sites and your designs will be much better off. As a quick thank you is that again, I'm a partner at an awesome branding and design studio. And we like to say that your competitors want you to neglect your brand. And so we don't want that to happen. If you are at a certain spot where you feel like you're not quite presented in the way that you know you should be, or you're looking to raise a new round and your brand doesn't quite reflect the success that you have, I'd love to talk. And then finally, as a founder myself, I would love to get your thoughts on Timewell. So you can check it out at timewell.io. Again, thank you so much for your time. 
Hey everyone, my name is Rebecca Bichachi and I'm from Oracle NetSuite. I'm really excited to talk about messy financial data and how to gain control because I spent the last 10 years helping businesses do just that. I was working in public accounting and I would see hundreds of clients every year and I loved the challenge of taking a disorganized set of books and working directly with the businesses and with clients to clean it up and make some sense out of it all. And one part of it was, at the end, being able to produce financial statements with true, accurate information and helping my clients understand how their business performed. But what I really loved was building a plan for these businesses who didn't have one and creating a structure that served them and their financial reporting needs. So I've seen it all, and I'll explain exactly what you need to do to wrangle your financial data into place. But first, I want to establish what we mean when we use phrases like messy data and clean data. Now I'm going to throw it back to the foundations of accounting, where we learn that good information, especially good financial information, is accurate, relevant, and timely. Now, the more that you sit with this concept and digest it, the more that you see that, yeah, good, clean data really does just boil down to these three things. Now, once we define these three critical characteristics of good financial information, we can understand that messy financial data, as complicated as it may seem, also boils down to just three things. It's inaccurate, incorrect and full of mistakes. It can be disorganized and sorted inconsistently, rendering its findings meaningless and irrelevant. And it could be late, stale, or even missing. Now, the issue here is that we use financial data to measure current value and past performance. Incorrect, disorganized, and stale data makes it difficult to form the true picture. And if we can't accurately determine where we are now and what we've done in the past, then it's nearly impossible to create the right plan for the future. But it's not enough just to clean up messy data. We need to get it under control. And that means something different than just clean. To have control literally means to have power or authority over something. But when we think of financial information and data and the thousands of transactions and millions of data points that we're supposed to have authority and control over, it can be intimidating, of course. But if you organize that data methodically, establish a framework and a structure for that data, and define your processes and your workflows, that is how you can establish control and effectively manage your financial data. A good structure for financial data is kind of like a building. There's a framework of beams in a building that hold it together and quite literally establish the structure of the building. Now, I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure you don't have beams every six inches. That's too much structure, but you can't have them miles apart either. Now, it's similar when we look at structures for financial data. General is good, not too general, because our accounting reports will just crumble from lack of structure, but not too specific either, because that makes the structure too rigid and inflexible. And that flexibility is important in buildings and financial structures. It allows us to layer in more detail, kind of like walls, and it gives our structures more form. And that's something we can control. So what exactly do we need to establish that control over our financial data? If there was never any to begin with, or if there was and things just got messy and disorganized along the way, how can we get our financials back in line? First, we start by sectioning out the mess approaching it logically and methodically so we can sweep through everything efficiently. We follow the balance sheet down, running through each account and reconciling the information. During the reconciliation process, you'll find that some transactions are missing from that account and you can find them and enter them or fix them on the spot before proceeding and completing the reconciliation for that period. But after the reconciliation, you can also be left with extra transactions in the account that are still sitting there unreconciled because, well, maybe they don't belong. So we need to determine where they came from. If they were just transactions that were duplicated, 
where one of them was reconciled and this is the extra one, or if they were incorrectly entered and sorted, shouldn't have existed in the first place. So we look into them and correct them either one by one or with one big summary adjustment. Now, at this point, after following the balance sheet and income statement all the way down, you'll have covered all accounts and transactions for the period, and you'll know everything is categorized where it belongs. But now we also need to look at the structure of our account to determine if we have too few or too many. We can add new ones if needed for additional structure and eliminate or merge any that aren't necessary. Now that the messy financials have been straightened out with an in-depth review, we need to establish good data management practices to ensure it never happens again and ensure that we maintain the proper level of control. So it's important that we establish a new set of good data management practices. Keeping our messy financial data under control is not a one-shot deal. The effort needs to be continued, and this is probably the most important part of getting your financial data under control. I had one client that I would help every year, and every time he left, the books were spotless, organized, with a low-maintenance structure set up. And I would have a conversation with his accounting team and show them what I did, explain what caused it, and how things should be done differently. But unfortunately for my client, some people on that team refused to adopt the new processes and refused to improve their practice. And at the end, my client was right back where he started every year. Because clean financial reports are non-negotiable. And so these good data management and accounting practices that we need to establish revolve around consistency, accuracy, and timeliness. And it's absolutely critical that we ensure that we are willing to sustain our processes and our progress, and that they will be sustained by our team and our resources. Every data process, data entry process, review process, or reconciliation, whether manual or automated, needs to have every task in the workflow executed consistently, following the same rules and the same logic every time. And of course, accurately, with no mistakes and within the appropriate window of time. Now, if all future data is entered correctly and consistently to the refined structure in the proper time frame, we can be sure that our financial information will stay organized and far from that tangled mess we started with. So to wrap everything up, we established that good information is accurate, relevant, and timely. And if your financials are none of the above, they're inaccurate, don't provide relevant information, and are never ready when you need them, you can follow a methodical review and analysis of each account and correct, add, or eliminate transactions and accounts as needed. And it's critical to establish proper data practices and improve accounting processes. And to ensure it doesn't happen again, prevention measures like consistency and automation and detection measures like alerts and reviews are key. So now, armed with these concepts, you can calmly approach your financials with your to-do lists and plans and get your messy financial data under control. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap up today's episode. If you want more tactical content, that's what we do here at Founding University, things that you can apply at your startup today, or even a mid-sized or large company, maybe you're at a big company, be sure to hit subscribe on YouTube or on your favorite podcast player. And if you've got an MVP or an idea and you want to build it into a company, we have a 12-week Founder University program. You can apply to it, founder.university slash apply. We've invested $25,000 into each of about 20 companies now to help them grow. And that's why we do Founder University. We want to meet founders early and get to know them. We trade all this knowledge to the founders. And sometimes they uh, turn them into very big companies and they let us invest a little bit of money in their companies, which we love uh, to be in partnership with founders. So again, you can apply for the upcoming cohort at founder.university slash apply. And if you want to present your own tactical talk here on this pod and you think you got what it takes, 
you can submit your presentation at founder.university slash submit. Yeah, just make a little presentation, send it to us. If it's really good, you might just get that phone call. Okay, we'll see you next time.